It's great to see everyone tonight. Good to have our visitors. We want to say welcome to you. I'm glad that you have come out to worship with us and study a portion of God's Word. I want to remind everyone this coming Friday of the debate class that we're going to have on the subject of baptism. We watch a video debate and we have a discussion on it. It's on the subject of baptism, whether it is essential for salvation or not. And it's always uh, been good classes and good discussions in the past. And this debate class will be up here at the building. It was going to be at our house here in Roy City, but that house is not quite ready for classes yet. And therefore, it's going to be up here at the building at 730, and it's for all ages. It's not limited to anyone. So if you have an opportunity to uh, come out, please do so. We're looking at the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. We're on the very last aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. The Apostle Paul says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self Control. Self-control. Then again, he says in verse 23, against such there is no law. Notice verse 24. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh, its passions and desires. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. Self-control. This aspect of the fruit of the Spirit is very important because without it, the rest of the component parts of the fruit will not come together. It's very important to have self-control, as we will see. This word, self-control, as we have the Greek word up here on the board, is pronounced ekratia. And ekratia comes from a root word, kratos, which means strength. And ekratia means one holding himself in. The word self-control or that compound word is that one Greek word in the original language. And it's pretty much self-explanatory. Self-control. To hold oneself in. The Greek scholars tell us it is the virtue of one who masters his desires and passions, especially his sensual appetites. Another Greek scholar says where this virtue consists and is uh, applied, temptation can have little uh, influence on that individual. Self-control. Controlling one's self. This is a lesson that's good for all of us, it's good for me, in various aspects of our life. Uh, None of us can say that we have mastered everything that we need to master as far as living the Christian life. As we look at the aspect of the fruit of the Spirit, all of these things are things that we all need to work on. All of us can say that. And we're going to look at some specific areas in which we can work on this. This word that is translated self-control is found three times in the New Testament. It's found in Acts chapter 24, if you want to turn over there. Acts chapter 24. You have the Apostle Paul on trial. He is before Felix. And he is teaching him concerning the things of Christianity. Notice verse 25, Acts chapter 24 and verse 25. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid. Some translations say Felix trembled. And answered, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Felix heard this message when Paul was reasoning about righteousness, that's doing what's right according to God's standard, 
and self-control, that's that word there of holding oneself in, having control over oneself, and the judgment that is to come, Felix was terrified. He was afraid. He trembled and said to Paul, I'll call you when I have a convenient time to speak with you on this matter. So this aspect of of righteousness goes along with self-control. In righteousness, you learn God's will. What is right? And how do you carry out the righteousness of God in your life? You've got to have self-control to do that. Control of oneself. And then realize someday you're going to be brought into judgment for how you have conducted your life. Therefore, self-control is part of righteousness. One person said the word follows righteousness in Acts 24 and 25, which represents God's claims. Therefore, self-control is to be man's response to such claims. We respond with self-control according to the righteousness that's revealed in the Scripture. It's also found here in Galatians chapter 5. And verse 23, as we look at the fruit of the Spirit, as we said before, it is very important to have self-control. If you don't have self-control, you can't have the fruit of the Spirit in your life. So it's found there. And it's also found in Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 1. The Apostle Peter writes by inspiration, Second Peter chapter 1. As he lists all of these things that are called the Christian graces. He says in verse 5. Also for this very reason. Give all diligence to add to your faith virtue. And to virtue knowledge. And to knowledge self-control. To self-control perseverance. And to perseverance godliness. He goes on to say in verse 7. To godliness brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So self-control is mentioned here by the Apostle Peter as being a key ingredient in living the Christian life. Having our self-control. Our self under control of God's will. Those are the three places that this word is found. One writer said it follows knowledge. In 1 Peter chapter, or excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6, it follows knowledge suggesting that it is learned and requires it to be put into practice. You've got to learn self-control. It starts when children are young. That's why parents must discipline their children. So that they can understand you have to have self-control. It's not okay to act any way you want to act. You have to have self-control. Because if that self-control is not learned in in childhood, then that attitude of being out of control will carry over into them being teens and adults. You know, it's not natural for us to have self-control. The Old Testament speaks of how it is hard for us And how it is detrimental. Look at Proverbs chapter 16. It's detrimental for us not to have it. Proverbs chapter 16. It's difficult for us to have self-control. Proverbs chapter 16. And verse 32. Solomon writes by inspiration and he says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. So Solomon is saying here by inspiration, when a person is able to control their emotions, and we'll talk more about that later on, when someone has this ability to control their anger, that's better than a mighty person who is a warrior. And in typical Hebrew parallelism, he gives another example in the latter part of the verse. And he who rules his spirit, that is, they're slow to anger, they rule their spirit, they have self-control, that person is better than one who takes or captures a city. You think about in the ancient world, what would a general want more 
than to be able to be a mighty warrior and to be able to conquer the city of his enemies. And Solomon is saying here, to, to have self-control, to, to rule your own spirit is better than taking a city. Because you're able to control yourself. Look at Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs chapter 25. In verse 28. Solomon says, Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. In the ancient world, walls were very important to to a, a city. It was its primary form of defense. And when you have a city that had broken down walls, that means it was open for attack at any time. It had no defense. And so Solomon is saying here, the person who does not have self-control, who does not have, have rule over his own spirit, is open for anything. Just as a city. That's walls have been broken down, is open for attack. A person who does not have self-control, they are open for anything the devil throws at them. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24, we've already looked at this verse as, as Paul says, those who are Christ, in other words, those who belong to Jesus Christ, those who are Christians, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. To crucify means you kill. And he's saying they have put to death or killed its passions and desires. A Christian, the one who belongs to Christ, is not one who's ruled by their feelings or ruled by their lust. They're ruled by the will of God. They practice self-control. You know, James says in James 1 and verse 26, if you don't control your tongue, if you don't control your speech, your religion is useless, James 1, 26. And he talks about in James chapter 3, verses 7 through 10, how that all kinds of animals have been tamed, but this little member that's in our mouth cannot be tamed. And if it's not tamed, it can do so much damage. Self-control. We'll talk more about that as we make practical application in just a moment. We're not ruled by anything as Christians except by the law of the Lord. Look at Romans chapter 8. This is how we are to walk. This is how we are to conduct conduct ourselves as Christians. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh. That's out of control. But according to the Spirit, that's self-control. They're not walking according to the flesh, what they feel like doing. But according to the Spirit, they have self-control. They're in submission to the will of God. Verse 2, for the, law of the Spirit of, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That law of the spirit of life, talking about the gospel, that's God's power to salvation. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Therefore, this law of Christ has made us free from the bondage of sin. Romans chapter 6 talks about that bondage. We have been set free from that. We're not free to do whatever we want. We're free to walk according to the spirit. We're free from the guilt of sin. There is now no condemnation in Jesus Christ. We've been forgiven of our past, and we are now free to walk in self-control. According to the will of God. Doing His will. And you know, that's part of being a disciple. When Jesus called people to Himself, look at Matthew chapter 16. He wanted them to know If they were going to follow him, there were some requirements. Matthew chapter 16. You think of the word disciple. The root word of disciple is discipline. When a person is disciplined, they have self-control. 
Self-control. And Jesus here says in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, He said to His disciples, If anyone desires to come after Me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Me. That's hard to do. To deny ourselves. That means we have to have self-control. That means we are not the master of our life anymore. That means our decisions, everything that we decide to do, is governed by the righteousness of God that's found in the Scripture. Deny ourself. Take up the cross, that sacrifice, and do the will of the Lord. Follow me. Do His will. He says in verse 25, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You lose your life for the cause of Christ. That doesn't mean necessarily dying, but it did in the first century in a lot of, in a lot of places. That means you lose yourself. You give yourself over to the cause of Christ. You will find it. You will find true life. Verse 26, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Verse 27, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father and with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. He begins this message in verse 24 by talking about if you're going to follow me, you've got to deny yourself, you've got to practice self-control and do my will. Then he ends it in verse 27 by talking about judgment. We're going to be brought into judgment according to what we have done. We will be rewarded each according to His works. Self-control is very important for us if we are going to be the people that God would have us be. Now let's look at some practical areas when we talk about self-control. Let's look at some things in each of our lives. Let's look at ourselves and think of ourselves, not the person next to you, Think of yourself when it comes to this aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. Self-control. As we look at our speech, James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Uh, James, by inspiration, talks about the danger of language. We touched on it earlier. Controlling our tongue. James 3 and verse 1, he says, My brethren, let, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Why? Because they will be responsible for the, those whom they influence by their teaching. Verse 2, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect or mature man, able also to bridle his whole body. And he goes on to talk about bits in the horse's mouth. Verse 3, and I read it on a ship, verse 4, how they are very small, but yet that very small device controls something very powerful. He's talking about self-control in our speech, and later on he talks about how dangerous our speech can be if we do not practice self-control in our language. Self-control in our speech. What about self-control when it comes to our emotions? Some Christians have an emotional chip on their shoulder. And it doesn't take much to knock it off. And everything with them is just so dramatic. And with that drama comes all kind of things that result in what we talked about earlier... Things that should not be said in their speech. Emotions out of control are dangerous. Just like a fire out of control is dangerous. A fire in its place in the fireplace does much good. But you take that fire out of the fireplace, it does so much damage. Emotions, we have been created with them. But emotions out of control can do so much harm. Look at the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians, chapter 4. 
Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 26. Paul says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Verse 27. Nor give place to the devil or opportunity for the devil to work. If the devil can, he will cause us to lose control in the realm of our emotions, whether it be anger, whether it be being upset, whether it be frustration, cause us to say things we ought not say, we lose control of our tongue, and then sins multiply from that point on. Self-control when it comes to our emotions. Realize that we have to be in control of ourselves. When we get angry about something, when we get upset about something, it's not wrong to get angry. He says here in verse 26, he doesn't say don't get angry. He says be angry and do not sin. Christ got angry, but he didn't sin. So we're not to express our emotions, but we're to do it in a controlled manner. We're to have self-control, holding ourselves in. Controlling ourselves, Realizing if you're going to say something out of an emotion that you're going to regret later. Control yourself. Don't say it. Cool down. Then later on speak. Self-control in the realm of our emotions. What about sexuality? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Self-control in this realm is something that is needed. Intimacy is to be expressed only within the covenant of marriage. The Bible plainly teaches. Anything expressed outside the covenant of marriage is sinful in the sexual arena. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. Self-control in the realm of sexuality. Paul says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality or fornication. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. That's talking about the physical body. You keep your body under control. And he says, verse 5, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. What do people in the world do? They meet someone, they're attracted to someone, they engage in sexual relations with them. That's the norm in the world. And he says that's the passion of lust that the world does, and they don't know God. There's nothing wrong with being physically attracted to someone. If you have self-control, you control yourself. And we can control ourselves because the Bible is telling us to do something and the Bible will not tell us to do something we can't do. Self-control in the realm of sexuality. What about in the realm of drug abuse? Whether it be prescription drug, whether it be legal drug, alcohol or nicotine, or whether it be illegal drugs, which is against the law anyway according to the will of God. Any abuse of substances or or drugs is wrong. Look at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. It's covered in one word, one principle. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 21, as, as Paul is talking about the works of the flesh, he says in verse 21 of Galatians 5, Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Drug abuse. The word drunkenness covers getting high, getting drunk. And whether it's abusing prescription drugs or anything of that nature, it's an out-of-control attitude. And it leads to so much harm. And so much hurt. What about gluttony? It's been brought to my attention here recently that I must have a problem with gluttony. Because I'm overweight. 
And therefore, I don't speak on the subject of gluttony because I have that problem. This person brought to my attention. Well, let's look into the Bible and see what the Bible says concerning the subject of gluttony. Look at Proverbs chapter 23. Is it true that every person who is overweight is a glutton? According to this person criticizing me, that must be true because they said, obviously, based on looking at me, I must be a glutton. And therefore, I have no right as a preacher to do my job that First and Second Timothy and Titus tells me to do, to rebu rebuke, reprove, and exhort. I can't do that because you're out of control yourself. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 19 through 21. Hear, my son, and be wise, and guide your heart in the way. See, notice, this is God's revealed will. We understand this revealed will. We put it into practice. Therefore, you have self-control. Verse 20, do not mix with wine bibbers or with the gluttonous eaters of meat. Verse 21, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. Obviously, here, the proverb writer is talking about someone who is out of control with what they drink and with what they eat to the point it causes them to be poor. Now, there is a problem with someone who constantly, continually gorges themselves on food. But you can't just look at someone and draw that conclusion. My father worked out at LTV, which is called Vault and called Chance Vault and changed names about every five years, for about 40-something years. And he worked with a man that uh, was a real good friend of his. And this man ate all the time. We're talking five cheeseburgers. We're talking several orders of fries. He could eat a large pizza, no problem. And he would constantly eat. And as I give you this description of the person, you probably think this person is just obese. He wasn't. He was actually physically fit. He was muscular. He had no fat on him. But yet, he ate constantly like a gluttonous person would. And you know what? In his 40s, he died of a heart attack. But looking at him, you would not think he was a glutton. But he was because of his eating habits. And my father witnessed his eating habits. He went to dinner with him, went to lunch with him, and saw how he ate. The person who criticized me has never seen me eat. Never seen me eat. Am I trying to excuse myself being overweight? Not at all. I need to take better care of this temple that God has given me. And so I make no excuses at all. But this person who, who make, made this critical uh, comment about me does not know whether, number one, I have diabetes or not. Do people with diabetes have weight control problems? Yes. Do people with some sort of medical conditions have weight control issues? Yes. This person doesn't know. This person is doing what John chapter 7 and verse 24 says you don't do. You don't judge according to outward appearance. But you judge righteous judgments. Look at Luke chapter 7 as we consider gluttony. Luke chapter 7, verses 33 through 35. Some people you will never make happy. Ever. Luke chapter 7, verses 33 through 35. Jesus said, For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, He has a demon. Verse 34, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Verse 35, but wisdom is justified by all her children. They were looking at John the Baptist, and he wasn't a social fellow when you study the New Testament. He was a voice crying in the wilderness, 
He was fulfilling prophecy concerning that, and he would preach and proclaim, and so he did not socialize, and as a result of that, they were saying, he's got a demon. Christ is saying, well, here I am. I am socializing, and you accuse me of being a drunkard and a glutton. Some people you will never make happy. We must understand that we must have self-control. Can all of us say here that we all the time eat perfectly exactly what we should be eating? I know I can't. I need to, to have self-control in every area of my life and especially that area. That's something that we can all work on as we consider that word and as we consider that aspect of the fruit of the Spirit, self-control. Let us work on that as we try to help one another. The person who made the criticism, it all boils down to this. It's easier to criticize the preacher than to repent and acknowledge sin. That's really what it boils down to. I don't take it personally. Look at the book of Galatians chapter 5 and we'll conclude by looking at this. Galatians chapter 5. I want you to notice verse 23. As he talks about meekness or gentleness and self-control, he says, against such there is no law. You think about human society. There has never been a society that has made a law against love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, Meekness and self-control. No society is going to do that. Because this fruit of the Spirit, the, all of these qualities, enhances and betters a society. No society in their right mind is going to make a law against this. And when we put this into practice in our life, as we look at every one of these aspects, and try to the best of our ability to say, I need to improve and do better. And walk in the Spirit as we find His will revealed in the Word. We will produce the fruit of the Spirit in our life. If there's anyone here tonight who has not obeyed the Gospel, you might be kind, you might be patient, you might have some aspects of the fruit of the Spirit, but you can't truly produce the fruit of the Spirit until you become a Christian. Believe in Christ with all your heart. Confess Him as the Son of God. Repent of your sins and be immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then from that point on, throughout your whole life, you can produce the fruit of the Spirit in your life. If you've done that and you've stopped producing fruit, repent and come back to the Lord as always. The choice is yours while we stand and sing.